Hello everyone, Derek Floyd here, Beautiful Now Podcast. Welcome to another edition of Chasing the Impossible. This is the segment where we interview special guests who happen to have accomplished impossible things on their journey to success, and we have them share their story with you, the viewer, to remind you that you know what? You can do it too. If you enjoy this content, please hit a like and a subscribe on the channel you're watching, like YouTube, or hit a follow if you're watching on Facebook or Instagram. And we've even invited Twitch to the party, so please make sure you're getting your content wherever you enjoy great entertainment. Last but not least, we're always being powered by and sponsored by IK Multimedia and Lewitt Microphones. Now, my special guest today just happens to be a husband, a father, a businessman, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist all rolled into one. And on top of all that, he just happens to be the CEO and founder of the United States' largest online music retailer, Sweetwater, where most of us buy our gear. I buy my gear there, too. So let me help me welcome my good friend, CEO and founder of Sweetwater, Chuck Sorok. Chuck, you there today, buddy? I am here, Derek. It's great to be with you today. Thanks for taking a few minutes out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk to me and my subscribers today. How are things going for you over at Sweetwater? I'm doing well, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. I've watched several of your episodes, and I've just I've loved. I've been inspired every week when I listen to them. So I, I'm just uh, humbled and honored you asked me to be here today. And you're staying safe from all this COVID madness, washing hands, taking care of yourself, staying healthy. You guys good over there? Oh, well, we're trying. It's a, it's a struggle. It's a new world for all of us. I mean... No one in our in our lifetime ever expected anything like this, but uh, as a society, we're getting through it. Just when will it end? That's the question. When will it end? And the real question is, what will the new normal be? I mean, because we can't go back to what was. It will all be completely different. The world has changed, right? Yeah, it's not. And, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the live performances and musicians and yeah. all the people that, that are used to interacting with others. And we can't do that right now. It's just really hard. And I know that you and I have spoken about how this is affecting live musicians, all parts of the entertainment industry, from the Broadway shows to movie theaters, movie sets, cinematography, everything in between. How do we bounce back from this when this is where we got most of our peace of mind, where our society found itself to be encouraged? There's no entertainment now. What do we do? Oh, yeah. And it's not just the musicians. It's the sound crew and the lighting folks and the bus drivers and, frankly, the hotels and airplanes. The whole whole society, the whole thing of of live entertainment is just suffering so bad. And it's not coming back this year in 2020. I hope it comes back in 2021. Yeah, I I think we're feeling the effects of not having the arts or having the entertainment industry be there because that's where we get our release. That's where we find our way to be able to just let our hair down and decompress and, and get away from the world for a while. I think we feel like we're feeling that, don't you? Absolutely. And I think that's part of the, the unrest that we've had across our country. Uh, people being locked up at home, not being able to, to do the enjoyable arts or view the arts, be engaged with the arts. And all that is just adding to, to the stress that everybody feels today. Yeah, yeah. Now, enough about the negativity in the world. We already have enough of that being thrown at us from every direction. People come to this channel to hear something positive and encouraging. So let's start with your story. Now, obviously, I said that you began and you built and you are still founder of the company Sweetwater, which is the largest online music retailer in the United States, which is not a bad thing to have done. Tell me a little bit how that got started, because I hear you were born in Ohio. You're a Buckeye. Go Bucks, go Bucks. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing story. I was born in Southern Ohio, although I moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is where we're based, uh, as a teenager. My mom was from Fort Wayne, and so my dad wanted to move us back to be with grandparents. So when I was going into seventh grade, they moved to Fort Wayne, and uh, uh, I took a lot of music classes, but also was going down the path. I wanted to be a doctor. I love children. wanted to be a pediatrician. Really? A doctor? Even a pediatrician? I never knew that about you, Chuck. Uh, I, I, I love children. I really do. And, and that's what I wanted to do, but uh, through school, middle school, and then high school, I took lots of music classes, but all the college prep stuff. So, you know, Latin and chemistry and all those required things. And immediately after high school, I went on the road as a musician thinking I would play for about a year or so. And then I'd come back and go to college and medical medical degree and all that. Um, I played saxophone, keyboards, and I played all over the country. And and after about a year or so of doing it, I couldn't stop. Once the music is bubbling in your blood, (laughs) you just want to keep doing music. So I played on the road for about five years. Wow. I played almost, almost every state in the country. I obviously didn't get to Alaska or Hawaii and a couple other states out west, but probably 45 of the states or so. Wow. And back then we had music six nights a week. So you would play from Monday night to Saturday night at nightclubs and hotels, restaurants, that sort of thing. But after about five years, 
um, came home and decided to, you know, living out of a suitcase in a, in a relatively cheap hotel was not necessarily a formula for a good life. And, sure. um, through those years, I'd always been the technical guy in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, I recorded uh, the bands quite often. I ran the mixer from the side of the, the stage in most of the bands. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, there weren't really big recording studios. Most recording happened at radio stations. Mm -hmm. And so when we'd go from one town to the next town, you'd make a commercial by going into the radio station, and they'd have an old Ampex or a Scully 8-track, occasionally a 4-track. Mm -hmm. I was always the guy that was technical, so I learned how all that equipment worked. And I should say I ran the mixer from the side of the, of the, mix, of the stage where we played. And so I had a lot of background, and I gathered a few pieces of, of equipment while I was on the road, and very humbly with my VW bus, which was a hand-me-down from my parents. The only thing they gave me, I had no money. I mean, again, I'm just, it's, sure. it's sort of humble, it's just unbelievable to me. Uh, but they gave me that in jun as a junior in high school. So for my junior and senior year of high school, I drove this beat-up VW bus. I mean beat up. My, pop, my mom had wrecked it into a telephone pole, oh so it had a God. V down the middle. I filled it with five gallons of Bondo, and then I bought headlights from Tractor Supply that looked like bug eyes, wow. and I painted it. The, the true story, I painted it with, with cans of 99-cent blue spray paint from Kmart. <laughs> <laughs> man, I remember Kmart. I haven't seen them in a really long time, but man, Kmart, that's going back, buddy. There are many Kmart left. But that's, <laughs> that's what painted the bus, and that's what I used on the road. But uh, came home after being on the road and, and started a mobile recording studio. And uh, today, you know, I think about that, I just laugh how, how yeah. humble that was. But I would pull the bus alongside the school, the church, wow. the nightclub. I'd run 100 feet or 200 feet of microphone cables inside, mic oh, up wow. the band, the choir, the speaker, whoever it was. And I'd sit in the bus with my headphones and my four-track reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and I would record those artists or the speaker or whoever it was. And uh, eventually I moved to an eight-track recorder and even a 16-track recorder, but I would take those recordings from my VW bus to the living room of my 12 by 55 mobile home. Wow. Wow. I mean, I'm going to pause you for just a second, just for a minute, because there was so much packed in that intro of your story. I mean, I'm thinking you started at the VW bus and you started in a small town in Ohio. What was the name of the town again? Because if you're, you're a Buckeye, we got to know these things. It's called Waverly. It's about an hour south of Columbus, the okay. capital. Well, I got to say, I never knew you were from Ohio. And that makes us kindred spirits because I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I, mean, I think it's close to your town, I think. They're probably so, 75, 90 miles apart from each other. There you go. Now, I know you started playing saxophone really early. I thought it was like six or seven years old. When did you start playing? No, I started in fifth grade. Fifth grade. Like most kids back did, did back then. Actually, I wanted to play trombone. Right. And uh, my dad says, no, you want to play saxophone. I said, no, I want to play trombone. <laughs> and he said, no, saxophones, because they get all the solos. Yeah, and right. When you're, when you're 13 years old, fifth grade, you know, you don't know what solos mean, but <laughs> my dad had uh, financed his way through college. He's a chemical engineer, but he financed his way through college by playing accordion. No way. The accordion? Are you serious? He knew polkas, northern Ohio. <laughs> uh, I think he was sort of frustrated as an accordion player, which is why he wanted me to play saxophone, so he could sure. live like directly through me. <laughs> And when you mentioned the saxophone, I got to tell you, through the industry, I've heard through the grapevine that you're actually a really good saxophone player. And you've been playing for years, obviously. And I think if you've played in 45 states across the country, you probably quake quite a bit. But they really say you're good. And you wouldn't gloat about yourself, though. But would you say you're pretty good? I'm probably not as talented as, as uh, a lot of famous people are. But I play well enough that I can fool a lot of people. I play in a lot of different bands and a lot of different styles of music. And, and that's an education in itself. And, exactly. and I, love, I love the interaction with the people in the band. And I love the interaction with the people in the audience. So it, I, I think it's been just a great experience. And you mentioned that you were kind of the techie of the group. You know, always kind of doing all the technical stuff behind the scenes. When did you know that this was kind of be your ball of wax, kind of your passion? How did that kind of fall in your lap? Yeah, and I was kind of inspired. Uh, my eighth grade music teacher was a very, very inspirational teacher. He uh, uh, played tuba in the local Fort Wayne Philharmonic Orchestra. He just retired a couple of years ago after 45 years in the orchestra. Wow. He also played upright bass, string bass. And mm -hmm. I used to go out and see him. Exactly. And I would see him play at one of the uh, pizza places here in town. It's called Shaken's Pizza. And he played a little Dixieland combo. And it was before I could get into nightclubs and that sort of thing. But watching him play live music. But what he really did that inspired me, one day at, at lunchtime, I went in and we were going to have jazz band. Again, this is eighth grade. You know, so jazz band is a big band with five saxes and four trumpets and four <laughs> trombones. And I yeah. got there first and he was playing a recording uh, back again on a real, real tape recorder. And he says, what is this? 
And I said, it's obvious, it's a trumpet. He says, no, it's a gin. And I said, no, I know what a trumpet sounds like. He says, no, it's not a trumpet. I said, well, what is it? And he showed me that, again, he's a tuba player and low brass. He played trombone also. He'd taken a trombone and recorded it at three and three quarters inches per second on a real to real tape recorder, but he sped it up and played it back at seven and a half. So it played back an octave higher and twice as fast. And that just fascinated me how you could change the sound of an instrument like that. And so that's what really hooked me on recording. And then I started finding uh, tape recorders in those days had a product or uh, a feature called sound on sound. Mm -hmm. So you could record one sound and then record another on top of it. And mm -hmm. All the way through high school, we had uh, one of the very first synthesizers in our high school from all around the country, actually, a Moog synthesizer early on. And oh, Moog. I, Moog, yeah, a really early one called a Sonic 6. Mm. And my band director was a very, very traditional band director and had no idea how a synthesizer worked. So I took it upon myself to learn how it worked and taught other kids how it worked. And so I've just always been in the technology. And I say my dad was an engineer, so that helped too. I got a lot of help from him. So you kind of had the bug for like music technology early on, even in high school, playing with these keyboards and synthesizers and then talking about sampling almost with a new guy with the trumpet and speeding up and slow it down. You were already destined for this technology thing, kind of, sort of, no? Wow, yeah, that, that's, that's, that bugs my mind. So here you are, you discover this kind of bug for music technology where you've got music plus these things you're learning on the side as far as the technology together, and you kind of get a, a feel for it. You kind of enjoy it, almost like a passion, right? And then you get this VW bus from your parents. How, how do you marry the technology side of things with your music passion and create this Vortec recorder idea? What was going on with that? I had no other better idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had bought a four-track recorder when I was on the road with our band, the, the last band I was with, mm -hmm. specifically to record the band. And again, you have to understand that uh, TAC tape recorders in 1976, 7, 8, 9, this was long before the digital technology that we have today. Sure. And so to have four tracks was just amazing. Was, I mean, at that point, that was huge. You had four tracks. It was like you were the Beatles or something. You had the same technology, right? That's crazy. So you'd record the rhythm section, and then you'd overdub solos mm -hmm. and vocals and all that sort of thing. And so I already had that, and it was really a, a, a nature of a necessity. You know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I came home with the bus and the, and the recorder, and I just came up with the idea to do it. I mean, I can see you always had kind of an entrepreneurial spirit from the things you did with your paper route and things like that to taking it to the VW bus and kind of creating this whole vibe you were doing with the four-track recorder. I mean, and now as I see you transition from what you did to now to Sweetwater itself, Sweetwater itself kind of has your spirit. It's an entrepreneurial kind of thing, always looking to serve other people and expand what we do and, and look for the great new thing that's out there. Uh, but as I have circled back, what were some of the influences that you had that started you as a musician? Who are the people that kind of influenced your mind to be able to start playing in the first place? Oh, wow. The, the first one, uh, which probably won't mean much to most of, of your audience today, but as a saxophone player, I remember uh, fifth grade and, and for Christmas that year, I'd only been playing the saxophone about uh, three months or so. You know, school starts in August or in September back then, three or four months. And my mom and dad got me a record uh, from a guy named Boots Randolph. Boots well, Randolph. That is. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I figured you wouldn't. <laughs> He's one of the most famous, infamous saxophone players who ever lived. Mm -hmm. uh, Boots was a, a, a just a phenomenal player. He was part of the Nashville uh, group of guys that played every day doing sessions. It was him on saxophone, Floyd Kramer on piano, Chet Atkins on guitar, on and on and on. Okay. And uh, Boots, through his later years, became a good friend of mine. But he would play sessions every day at 10 o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock in the afternoon, six o'clock at night. He was part of the Nashville sound, the rhythm section. His probably most famous thing that people might recognize is a really great rockin' sax solo in the middle of uh, Brenda Lee's "Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree." That's Boots Randolph. Wow. He, he he played on thousands, literally thousands of people's albums. He did fifty of his own albums, and and he had a hit that. When you heard the song, you know who it was. But uh, the song that's always played when somebody's rolling down the hill really fast, yeah. uh, called Yakety Sax, and it became the theme song for Benny Hill's TV show. And that <laughs> oh, was, that, 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 that's yeah. that's Boots Randolph. <laughs> so my mom and dad give me one of Boots's records with Yakety Sax and, and all this on it. And you have to understand, this is 1965 or something like that, and we're in this transition from mono to stereo and this is back when we still have records right and, and they buy me a record that's stereo but we only have a mono record player 
And so I turn on the first song, which is Jackety Sax, and it starts with and then and then and well anyway, when the sax is supposed to come in, it was on the other track. And so it didn't come in. I had just the rhythm section of Boots' band with no sax solo. And so I wish I'd have kept that album, but we actually did, we sent it back and bought the mono version of it. But Yakety Sax and Boots was my first hero. And then as I progressed a little further along when I got into middle school and high school, uh, the big influences for me were, were bands like Tower of Power and okay. Earth, Wind, Fire and, yeah. and Ohio Players and Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. And, uh, and, and I also studied a lot of the jazz guys too. And you know, I, I, have, I'm, I have a very eclectic uh, interest. If you got in my car right now, I literally would, would jump all over music genres from country. I wow. love rap. I love rap if it's done well. Yeah. I have a 13 year old daughter, so I'm listening to all the young chick <laughs> yeah, stuff that's going you know. on. Um, yeah, smooth yeah. jazz, and, and you know, I'm just I'm all over. As long as it's done well, I, if music is done great, I love any genre of music. I'm the board chairman of our Fort Wayne Philharmonic, so I listen to a lot of classical music. Yeah, I can see how you have a really great appreciation for all music. So, you know, here we are, you take this four track and your appreciation for music, so to speak, and you dream up the VW bus. And how does that lead you into creating what we now know as Sweetwater? How'd that get started? Yeah, great question. So I'm in this uh, 12 by 55 mobile home for a couple of years and I finally buy my first 1000 square foot house. Not a very big house, but I built a one and a half car garage off the end of it. And that's gonna be my first recording studio, my first real studio. And by then I had moved from the four track to the eight track, the 16 track. And not long after I moved into that new house and new studio, I bought a 24 track recorder, kind of the pro standard at the time on yeah. two inch tape, yeah. big mixing console and all that. And I did that for several years. And in 1984, a friend of mine owned a local music store and he asked me if I wanted to go to the NAM show in Chicago. That's when the NAM show was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And NAM stands for National Association of Music Merchants. I said, sure, I'll go along with you. And I went up there and I saw a prototype of the Kurzweil K250. Mm -hmm. And it was the first music instrument that played back digital recordings of other instruments. Mm -hmm. Now today we do that with samplers, we do it with iPhones and iPads, all those sort of things. But in 1984, this was just unheard of because computer memory was so expensive, the technology had not been invented. But this was designed by the futurist Ray Kurzweil mm -hmm. on a challenge or a dare from Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Uh, Steve Wonder had one of uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil's reading machines for blind people, and one and they'd become good friends. And one day, Stevie had asked Ray, "I wish I had an instrument that could play back all the sounds of the orchestra." Mm -hmm. And Ray said, "Why don't you buy one?" Stevie says, "There is no such thing. We have electric pianos, we have organs, we have synthesizers, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that'll play back a nine-foot grand piano or a fifty-piece string section mm -hmm. or upright bass." And so Ray uh, went with some engineers from MIT, and he designed this machine. Now, when I saw it. It was a room of about, I don't know, maybe 10 by 12, 10 by 14 foot, uh, full of computer boards and memory. And that's what they showed at that NAMM show. And I thought, how cool is that? And eventually they turned it into a real instrument with 88 keys and three big circuit boards. And I bought a very, very early one, serial number 32. And if I recall, that thing was massive. Like, like it was huge, right? Super big. <laughs> It's a bad analogy, but I tell people all the time, it's about the size of a casket. It was. It was a big piece. Yeah, but it was also just gorgeous. It had lots of big buttons on it because it was tactile for Stevie Wonder and for other yeah. blind people to find their way through it without having to go through lots of software menus. It was a full 88 note wooden keyboard, like a grand piano, and so the keys felt great. And uh, I got one, I, I started using it in my studio, and at the end of every one of my sessions, I could tell my customers, would you like to hear your music with a 50 piece string section or a 45 voice choir and that sort of thing. Um, but I also started reverse engineering it started designing my own sounds for it, sampling sounds for it, wrote software to make it easier to use that little two-line display that was on the front panel, and I made it uh, hook up with a cable and go into a nine-inch Macintosh 512 in those early days. You were writing and, code for that thing? <laughs> oh, yeah. What? And, and, and figured out how to take my sounds from floppy disks and put them on EEPROMs oh, so you wow. could put it permanently in your machine. And I became friends with all these famous musicians that had them. And it was Stevie Wonder and Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton and Bob James and Lyle Mays. And they started using my sounds. Kenny Rogers uh, used sounds. Uh, Stevie Wonder used sounds on his character's album, gave me credits for that. Nice. Uh, and, and before long, I'm helping my friends with their curse wilds. Wow. I was hoping to trade sounds with them, but most of them were not techie guys. They yeah. were just great musicians. And uh, they kept asking me questions and how to use my sounds. And uh, one day I got a call 
uh, that they wanted to buy another machine. And I'm thinking, wow, these machines are really expensive. Why do you want another one? And and it was, I wanted one for my green room. I wanted one for my bus. I wanted one for my lake house. And before long, Kenny Rogers had 14 of these Kurzweil K250 that he carried on the road because he was reproducing 30 and 40 years of his hits yeah. across all genres of music. Yeah. We had a customer who just died a few years ago, Michael Kamen, a very famous film composer. Michael had a home in Las Vegas and, and Boston and over in London. He had over 30 of these Kurzweil K250s wow. because they sounded so good. And every time he'd get one, he'd send it to us and we'd update it with all of our sounds and software. Nice. And one of the most famous, just a few years ago, Paul Schaefer uh, from David Letterman's yeah. band was still playing it as his main instrument until he went off the air. Yeah, it was a man. great instrument, great sounds. And uh, after selling a bunch of these, I became a dealer for them, started selling them to my friends. And one day I got a call from, from one of those friends and said, I understand you can do sheet music on the computer. And I said, yeah, I know how to do that. I'm doing that in my own recording studio. And so I became a dealer for, at that time, a product called Total Music. Mm -hmm. And then after Total Music, I became a dealer for a market unicorn product called Composer, which was long before Performer, which was long before Digital Performer. Wow. And... Uh, then they wanted some recording equipment, so I became a Tascam and a Fostex dealer. And by 1990, my business had changed from being just a recording studio to now I'm helping my friends <laughs> with music equipment all over the country. And we're, we just moved out of my house. At, at that point, 1990, I had five employees working for me, people coming all hours at of the your day. house. At my house, <laughs> yes. Five, five. And uh, I'd live upstairs, it was a split level house, and, and I'd live upstairs, and there'd be people downstairs, there'd be Tour buses pulling in the front yard, getting my neighbors all excited. Wow. They think Kenny Rogers was there or something. Kenny Rogers was never there. It was always the road crew or the managers. Right. Um, but enough was enough. So we built our first 5,000 square foot building in 1990. We moved in with those five employees. The next year, we, we'd outgrown that. So we built another 10,000 square foot, uh, added 20 employees. And we were there for 17 years. Wow. And we moved out in 2006 with 200 employees. And we moved into the location we're at today, which is on the northwest side of Fort Wayne on, on the Interstate Highway 30. Wow. Um, today we have nearly a million square feet of real estate. Mm -hmm. We have 1,800 employees. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm just thankful and, and, and so blessed each and every day. I, I'm just so humbled and honored. It started in a VW bus. <laughs> today, you know, we're the largest in the country of selling more equipment online than anyone else. And, you know, more than selling equipment. We're in the customer business, yeah. customer yeah. service business. I love that we fulfill people's dreams and aspirations and, and help them get to where they want to go. And we just happen to be selling music equipment. It is pretty amazing as I sit and think about it that your company does what this show, this, this segment's trying to do, which is help people chase their impossible, chase their dream. And Sweetwater's always done that for so many musicians across the country, across the world for that matter. Um, I do get the distinct privilege to say that I worked for you for eight years and you were the beginning of my music retail career, so who knew that, right? And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it and everything that comes across from you comes across in the people that work there. Everyone has that same what level of, of let's do the right thing, let's get it for the customer, the customer service driven thing. It's so real, so I can vouch for it, guys. This is how the companies run. But I have a story that maybe you didn't know, <laughs> and that is how I got to work for you. Check this out. So uh, my daughter, uh, I think she was 14 or something like that at the time, uh, I was working at the bank and I was an assistant manager for a bank and it was okay, you know, I was making good money, so on and so forth, but it wasn't what I really wanted to do. You know, I'm a musician, I'm a songwriter, and you knew that, and uh, I wanted to follow my dream and, and come into music, work in the music industry somehow, some way. And she pulls me aside one day and she's like, you know what, why don't you work for that Sweetwater company? That's where you spend all your money at anyway. <laughs> and here we are. A couple of weeks later, I go, you know what? I should. So I quit my job at the bank. And I applied at Sweetwater and got hired. So small world, interesting story. Chase my impossible directly to you in Sweetwater. How does that grab you? <laughs> kind of crazy, huh? Right. Of course, that was, that was over 20 years ago. That was way <laughs> Yeah, that was super long ago. I hate to age myself, but I think it was like over 25 years ago. It, it was a way back, way, way back. The 90s, that's what I remember. Yeah. It was a long time ago. <laughs> so it's kind of neat just to kind of sit back and think about how 
you started your impossible with Sweetwater and got me to start mine working for you and working in the music retail industry. So if you wouldn't have started yours, I wouldn't have had mine. So thanks for what you did and thanks for believing in yourself to start your own dream. And thanks for believing in me to let me work for you. It's been a great ride. And, and here I am now, I work for a company called IK Multimedia, as you all know, who are sponsoring this show. And uh, I've been with them for over 20 years. So man, what a ride it's been, huh? It's been a long time. You're very welcome, and it's cool that you've been able to see the growth we've had. I mean, oh, yeah. You've seen it. was quite small when you were here yeah. as compared to where we are today, and yet you still get to visit us, so I it's do, awesome. I do get to have the unique position to be able to see how the company's grown because I was there from the inside, and now I get to see this grow on the outside to circle back around, if you will, to now get to come back as a vendor, as a company that I used to work for. So it's been kind of neat to see the growth and, and how it's changed and how the culture has stayed the same but grown in such a huge way. It's, it's awesome to see. I'm so glad for you. So excited. So proud to be a part of it. I'm um, glad you're not at the bank. I talk all the time. <laughs> uh, I just am so, so blessed, so thankful. 41 years I've been able to do what I'm doing. I, feel like, years. I, I honestly believe, I feel like I've never worked a day in my life. I enjoy awesome. what I do. I enjoy the music part. I enjoy the people part. I'm inspired every day by the level of people that are in our company. I'm just, I'm thankful that I'm not having to do a job that I don't really like just for the money. Yeah. yeah. Now, taking a few steps back, you, you obviously had an entrepreneur spirit from the very beginning. So, so who influenced that in your mind? Was that your dad? Or was that some outside person or a mentor that you knew that kind of got you into being an entrepreneur, if you will? Well, it's a little bit of, of several things, and, and I'm sure my dad was part of it. He was a chemical engineer, but as I was growing up, he had many side jobs. He fixed washers and dryers. He had a TV repair business for a while. He was a professional archer. He was oh, a professional like, bowler. Like, really? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. He made an interesting thing, uh, which kind of was interesting with his, with his uh, accordion background. <laughs> he, he became a professional bowler for a short while. What? I, yeah, it's wild. I watched my dad, I'm not exaggerating, for nearly an hour bowl 300 game after 300 game after 300 wow. game. Like, like you almost have never seen. And he had invented a metronome that you put in your pocket. And back in those days, it was a little square pillbox, yeah. like about a one inch by one inch. And he would put that in his pocket. It had a little knob on it. He changed the tempo and run an earpiece up to his ear. And he figured out that if he walked to the approach line on the bowling alley and got his tempo and his stride exactly the same every time, he can become a very consistent bowler. And again, I watched him for hours bowl 300 games okay once in a while he got a 289 right it's just wild he took he took his product this this metronome up to brunswick in detroit at the time and they said well thanks mr Sirak, but we're not interested in that have a good day they sent him home two years later they came out with a bowling metronome based on what my dad had done oh my uh, gosh yeah he, he had another crazy he was always in uh, he was a math guy in, mm. in, in the late 50s uh, as a chemical engineer, he had access to a big government computer in Southern Ohio where we lived. Mm -hmm. And he would go to the horse races in uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio called Scioto Downs. Yeah. And he would follow all the horses. And he'd go back in on Monday morning to his secretary and ask her to put the results of the horse races into this government computer. And he feels <laughs> he was the first guy in the world to do computerized horse stuff. Oh my and gosh. He was all about numbers. He wasn't really about the, the, the betting part, sure. but he figured out if the track was a certain condition, the weather a certain condition, the weight of the jockeys, the horses, and all that sort of stuff. Wow. My dad did this until the day he died. He eventually moved to Las Vegas. Oh so my gosh. Watch, so he could walk bunches of horse tracks at the same wow. time with his own computer program that he had written to follow the horses. And he knew statistically, again, it was more about the $2 bet yeah. and the statistics, not the big dollar bet. Sure. But he knew statistically these horses on these tracks with this jockey, this temperature, odds are they're going to win. And it's just a crazy, crazy uh, math nut. But I think I was inspired by him quite a bit. Yeah, I would man. also tell you I was inspired. Um, frankly, I, I had kind of, I don't want a uh, pity party for this, but I had a kind of a rough situation at home with my mother. Okay. Uh, she has mental illness, and I know a lot of people have issues in their family, but I used the things I did to escape from mm -hmm. her. Uh, I have a, a younger brother and three younger sisters, so I'm the oldest of five, and we all escaped in different ways. Gotcha. Uh, some were better than others, and mine <laughs> was, I was going to, to excel at whatever I did. And so anything I did as a kid growing up, frankly, were ways to get out of the house. Wow, and wow. My first business was making potholders, where you take the little loops and put them in a frame, Go across back and forth, 15 cents a piece I would sell them for, or two for a quarter. My little town in southern Ohio, we had 5,000 people, and I sold over 10,000 potholders at age five, six, and seven. 
Man, you were an entrepreneur from the very beginning. I mean, five, six, seven years old, you were destined to do what you do. You'd always had it in your spirit from the very get-go, right? After that, most of my friends had 40 or 50 papers, but I figured out if you deliver to the senior citizens, which were really close, small little houses, mm -hmm. and apartment complex, I could deliver a lot more. So I was delivering 330, 340 papers every day. I just firmly believe if you're going to do something, be all in. Yeah, man. Hey, the, the other thing that really set me up, and I know it's not real popular today, but what set me up were Boy Scouts. Yeah. And a Boy Scout law says a Boy Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, clean, brave, and reverent. You remember them all. Look at that. Rattle them I off do. like that. Yeah. I think they're great principles to live by personally. Mm -hmm. I also think they're great principles to live by professionally. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't require my whole company to memorize those, but I've cited <laughs> them over and over, which is why I memorize them. But I've recited them to all my employees, and the second hour they're at Sweetwater, I just tell them it's really important to think about those principles. If you ever have a question of what to do, you know, trust with your loyal, helpful, I won't go through the whole list mm -hmm. again, but they can always Google them, they can find out. Mm -hmm. But we want to treat people, real simple, we want to treat people the way we would want to be treated. And just always, always, always do the right thing. And if we do that, you know, the business will come. And I've never been real concerned as a business guy about how much money do we make on this sale or this transaction. I want to do the right thing for the customer. And if I do the right thing for the customer, I know they'll come back. I know there'll be repeat business. I know there'll be referral business. But also, even more than all that, I know I can lay my head on my pillow at night that we've done the best job we can do for our customers. I know that sounds trite and sounds no, simple, but it's just what we really try and do each and every day. And guys, I know, I know you guys are thinking he can't be serious, but I mean, I've been there, I worked there, I know from the inside out, the outside in, this really is how the company runs. It's do the right thing. It's the, the core principles of character and integrity and have value and treat people the way you want to be treated. I mean, it boils down to the simple things, man. And this company really runs like that. There's no fluff. There's no, there's no hype. It really is that simple. And I guess that's where you're supposed to be, right? This is the way things should be. No, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. We call that the Sweetwater difference. Mm -hmm. And no matter what business you're in, you know, in, in the music products industry, we have 5,000 competitors across the United States. We have Amazon, you know, mm -hmm. across the United States. But the Sweetwater difference is the difference. And no matter what business you're in, whether it's real estate, whether it's selling cars or grocery stores, if you differentiate yourself by just doing the best job you can mm -hmm. and, and, and understanding it's about the people, it's a people business. I own about a dozen businesses mm -hmm. and there are a variety of things. We sell eyeglasses, we sell cars, we uh, teach people how to fly airplanes. But what's really common to all those businesses is we're in a people business, helping them fill, fill their dreams, their aspirations. And that's what every business owner should strive to do. Yeah. Yep, this is just it's so good, man. Just keeping it and, and helping people chase their impossible, doing it the right way with integrity. I love it. I love it. So um, as I sit back and think now going forward, you know, when you had Sweetwater and it began to grow and it got to a certain point, did you ever think, okay, this is where I, I want it to be? Or, or did you see Sweetwater growing to the capacity that it is now? I mean, could you have ever imagined it would be this big? Who knew, right? Eric, I wish I were that smart to tell you. <laughs> like, there's no, I'd be the biggest liar in the world if I told you I thought it would turn into this. Yeah. You know, in those early days, I was just trying to pay the bills. I was trying to, you know, when I had a few employees, I never, ever, ever wanted to not pay my employees. And I'm thankful 41 years, I've never laid anybody off. I've never been a dollar late paying anybody out. I would feel awful if I had to lay somebody off. Sure. And uh, but but I will tell you in those early days, my credit cards were maxed out. I <laughs> had a second mortgage on my house. I mean, I, I scrapped and did everything I could. But I also tell you that failure is not an option from my point of view. I just mm -hmm. firmly believe failure is not an option. There is so much, so much that you have control of. And I think you know, when we look at how medicine has changed in the last fifty or a hundred years. We're just now starting to learn about our brains and how they work. And you know, if you and I could come back in 50 or 100 years, I think we'd know a lot more about how much control our brains have over our, our well-being, sure. over our physical health, and all that sort of. And I don't want to get too, you know, 10,000 foot view here, but <laughs> I really believe failure is not an option and anything's possible. You put your head and heart to it. There's just a way. Yeah. And, and so, you know, in those early days, it was just one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. And there is no way I could have ever dreamed that it would be anything like this. I just knew whatever I did, I wanted to do it well. And, and as I did it well, it kept getting bigger and bigger and more people wanted to support us and people like being around winners and yeah. you know, all that stuff just worked to our benefit. But there's no way I could have ever anticipated this in any way, shape or form. Now, I know you mentioned that failure is not an option, and I completely agree when it comes to moving forward and achieving your goals. But um, 
I think I've spoken to so many different successful people and everyone always has told me that there's a type of failure or a fall that has that happens in your in your career where it teaches you something, teaches you lessons and that you learn so much from maybe a misstep or a fall. Um, was there ever a time or a situation where you had a failure or a, or a fall, so to speak, and you learned from it and it made you better? It, it kind of helped you grow in the way that you are now. I'll give you two different stories quickly. And the first one is in those early days of, of growing a recording studio from the VW bus to the small house. And, and, and even as the business started to grow, I was doing lots of radio jingles, a lot of local albums, that sort of thing. And the business professionals around Fort Wayne, you know, my attorney, the accountant, the bankers, family members even, would say, Fort Wayne, you can't do a recording studio in Fort Wayne. You need to be in Nashville. You need to be in L.A. You need to be in New York. It'll never work. I mean, they were pretty uh, condescending. And, you know, it's, it's a running joke. They would say, when are you going to get a real job? You know, and I heard that for about the first 20 years of my career. I don't hear that out of my family and friends anymore. They don't ask me when I'm getting a real job anymore. <laughs> And yeah. I am sure at that time I was disappointed. I was hurt. You know, I think they did it with good intentions. You know, I don't think anybody was trying to be mean to me, but I'm sure I got frustrated at the time. And, and what I would say now looking back, and I try and encourage younger entrepreneurs to think this way, those people didn't have my dreams. They weren't walking in my shoes. They didn't know what I was thinking. And frankly, I didn't know exactly what I was thinking either. I didn't know how it would be. Um, but for me to get upset with them, or disappointed it was probably a little arrogant on my part mm. and and they um, i can't blame them any more than you know i don't speak french and so you know, it was a different language to them sure. and, and what i had in my head and my dreams my aspirations it's not their fault that they you know and i probably should have had a little more patience now i did listen to them i did you know i took some advice from them and that sort of thing but what i would challenge other people today is listen to folks around you listen to people that have walked in your steps or similar steps but then on the other hand, it's your dream, it's your aspiration, just go for it. Mm -hmm. Go for it with, with smart education from people around you, but uh, don't let them hold you back because anything is possible if you really dream and think hard about it. Yeah. The part of the story I would tell you where I say failure is not an option. I'm, I'm pretty famous around our company. Back when the 2008, 9, 10 recession was going on, at that time I was on the board of directors of a publicly traded bank. And we were being told to call people's loans in, even though they might be current on their loans. But the government was saying, you have too many loans in this category or that category. Uh, General Motors had, had filed bankruptcy. You know, a lot of companies were laying people off. It was a pretty desperate time in that 2008, 9, 10. And I came back from one of those bank board meetings, um, sort of frustrated by the process of having to tell people that their loans were due, even though they were current on their loans. Wow. And I called all of our employees together. That time we had 225 employees. I brought them into our theater. Mm -hmm. And I said, as arrogant as this sounds, I'm choosing to not participate in this recession. And I said that to all my employees wow. at the time. I said, I don't want you looking over your shoulder for another job. What we need to do is buckle down and just do our jobs well. I've never laid anybody off. I'm not about to lay anybody off now. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is focus on what we do really well. Take care of the customer. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you during that next year or so, we changed from a company that had a lot of paper that flowed through our building with your paperless system. Mm -hmm. uh, we dropped a few brands of equipment that didn't make sense and were causing a lot of hardship for us and for our customers. Mm -hmm. We brought on some brands that we hadn't carried before, like drums. You know, We went from not selling drums back then to today we're a large reseller of drums. Yeah. But what we probably did the best during that period is we found good people that had been laid off at other companies mm -hmm. and I invested in them. I hired them and brought them to Fort Wayne, brought them to Sweetwater and during that recession period we were able to grow when a lot of other companies were hurting because I just said failure is not an option and that mm -hmm. just energized my people to be love that. <laughs> strong and enthused and, and that just that. it just works so well and you know today we have 41 years of every year our top line, the gross sales that we do, and our profit, the bottom line, are better than the year before. And mm -hmm. I don't take credit for that. I give credit to, to all the employees and the great customers that have supported us for so long. So wow. again, failure from my point of view is just not an option. There's a way. Maybe you'll turn, maybe you'll zig or zag, but there's always a way to make lemonade out of lemons. I just love the way you phrase that. And, and everybody that knows me knows I'm a big proponent of, uh, you know, it, you can always find a way. There's always a way to get it done. 
Um, don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. Let's figure it out together. We can always figure out a way. So I'm completely with you on where you're going with that. I think part of that came from being a musician. The creativity yeah. that it takes to be a musician, I think it's really, really helped me in business. I'm thankful yeah. that I have the music background to support the business background. Now, obviously, you, you talked a little bit about the success of Sweetwater and, and how it's all started and where it came from and, and you know, you, you being a Boy Scout and having these certain values and putting them into the company and just being the right thing because it's the right thing. And, and you've experienced this, experienced this growth year after year after year. But, you know, if there was someone on the outside that was kind of looking to understand how could they do what you do, what, what's the way to get that kind of growth. Is there something you can share that attributes your success in just a few sentences that says, hey, this is what I would do if, if I were going to be in business and, and try to get that same kind of growth. Give me a couple of sentences that would just clarify that. Uh, the first thing is, is the most obvious one, just doing the right thing for our customers. Uh, the referral business is unbelievable, the repeat business from customers. And we're able to do that because we hire the very, very best people. Um, you know, personally, the interview process, yes. you, it's you know the reference checking, <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and, and you know the training that we mm-hmm. go through. Every one of our sales engineers, as an example, goes through 13 weeks of all day long training. They, they go through about 300 classes taught by 80 different teachers. Mm-hmm. And so when they talk to a customer, they're pretty well trained. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect, we're all human beings, we make mistakes, but Sweetwater is also really good at fixing those mistakes that we might and occasionally quickly. make. Mm-hmm. We quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe that everyone in our company is either adding credibility or taking credibility away from our brain. And we just really want everyone to add credibility. And so um, the, the, the customer service are not just trite words. It's a way of life. It's ingrained into our culture of what we do in every way, shape, and form. Mm-hmm. And everyone in this company, whether you're a receptionist or the shipping department, and obviously sales engineers and marketing folks, are empowered to do whatever it takes to do the right thing for the customer and frankly for each other. Mm. And so if that means buying each other lunch, if that means paying for an Uber ride or replacing a keyboard or replacing a guitar, mm-hmm. all of our employees are empowered to do that. I never ever want to hear, oh, I need management approval. We, we just don't say that in this company because I know the level of people that are here and I want them to run the company as if it's their company. And I don't want the customer to have to be stuck in that. We need manager approval. It just doesn't happen here. Wow. Now, I got to tell you, it's been it's been a great conversation talking to you, Chuck. And, and, you know, I feel like I've learned a lot about you it's just in these few few minutes. And, and I've known you for 25 years. There's things I just didn't know. So it's been kind of nice to kind of kick back. We should have had lunch long before this. <laughs> but um, if I want to close it off and end it in a great way, I want to be able to encourage some people that are out there. Maybe there's a, another young entrepreneur out there that wants to start his own Sweetwater, his own company, his own dream, so to speak. And if you could give him one or two pieces of advice to say, hey, this is what I want you to do to be able to follow your dream, and you've done it all, what would you tell that young man or woman to do to follow their dream? I'd say, like I said earlier, anything, anything is possible. I would also say, as I said earlier, it's your dream. It's, it's the thing that you're thinking about, and just go for it. Put one foot in front of you. Know, you don't get instant success. You know, I, I probably the first 20, 25, 30 years, I didn't make much money. But one day I turned around and go, not only have I made money, but I've helped a lot of people. And, mm-hmm. and so when you have that big dream, just put one foot in front of the other and start working towards it, walking towards it. And one day you'll turn around and be blown away how far you've come. But mm-hmm. if you really believe in something, be all in 110%. Um, that's one of the things that I've always done, whatever I am, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, with my family, various hobbies and interests that I have. If I'm doing it, if it's worth doing it, I'm all in 110 mm-hmm. percent. As I talk to you today, I'm not being distracted with anybody coming into my office or on my cell phone. Right. When I'm talking to my 13 year old daughter, she gets my 100 percent undivided attention. And, mm-hmm. and I do that with everything I do. And that's what I would say if you have a dream or an aspiration. You got to be willing to be committed like nothing, like no one else ever has been. It's your, it's your dream. It's your vision. Go for it. It's mm-hmm. possible. I love that. I love that. You know, 100% committed, 110% committed, and I'm all in. I'm giving it all my attention. Uh, even when you talk about your kids and your family, when you sit down with them, you, you turn your phone off. You're not doing other things, not distracted. I need to work on that one. You got to be 110% committed to what's in front of you, to the dream that you have. I think that just that touches me and reminds me to do the same thing. So once again, learning from you, Chuck, even in this conversation. Um, but I also know, and I didn't get the chance to talk about this, but I want to kind of curtail this, is that you're a very, very generous giver. I mean, you give from your heart, you give through philanthropy, and, and kind of sort of, you know, 
where does that feel or how is that important to you as you've grown your business and now you've grown as a person, you feel like giving is such an important part of what you do? It goes back to the Boy Scout days. <laughs> You're always wanting to help others and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, we've been very blessed, Eric. Yeah. I came onto this earth with nothing, literally nothing. And I've been just so blessed. My wife and I are so thankful each and every day. Um, and as we are giving these resources, uh, we're, we're only on this earth for a, a few short years. And, and we know we can't take it with us. You don't see very many U-Hauls at the cemeteries. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we want to help others. And, and I try and not only do it myself, but I try and encourage the people around me. I try to encourage our employees at our company. You know, all of us that, that are probably watching this interview today and, and most of our customers, we've got a roof over our head. We've got three meals a day, probably have a car, maybe even two cars and a few material goods. And not everybody in the world is that fortunate. Mm. And, and sometimes not because of faults on their own, you know, just how they were born or maybe some really unfortunate incident. And I think all of us who are blessed so much need to give back. Uh, not just our finances, maybe sometimes it's our time or our talent. That's just as powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I think we all have the ability to give back, help others, and just make ourselves and our country and our world just a little bit better. And that's why my wife and I do it. We've been blessed and we want to help others. And we want to encourage and inspire others, help yet others again. So, man, let me just let me just close this by saying, you know, thank you one more time for, for taking the time and for making the time to speak with me and my subscribers today. Um, as I hear you uh, reset my brain, so to speak, to say that when you give that time that's committed to it, you really are committing 110%. So for you to take, you know, time out of your incredibly busy schedule to commit to talk to us means the world to me. And I know it means the world to our subscribers. And um, I hope they get as much as I got from this interview because I've, I feel like I've learned so much about how to appreciate it and do the right thing and to, to have the character and integrity. And I already have those things 95% of the time, but you've taught me to go a little deeper and to really believe in the dream and to apply those principles, just the daily rule, you know, the, the golden rule, do unto others. And you've taken those simple principles and you've made them into business core principles, which has been successful for you. So uh, I just feel like it's been a great honor to have you here. And I really appreciate you just stopping by and sharing your story because I know it really blessed me and I love that you feel blessed and I hope that our subscribers have been blessed too. So if you've enjoyed this content today, guys, please hit a like and a subscribe on the channel. Uh, share it with a friend, of course. We really want to make sure you guys are sharing this kind of content because there's so much darkness in the world right now. There's so much heaviness. We need to be able to share something positive, something uplifting, something encouraged, something to inspire you to say you really can come out of that place you're in and, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is something else out there. You can do it. Your impossible is possible. So thanks for stopping by, guys. I appreciate all of you. Uh, and if you have any questions, please send us an email or, or respond back on the threads here. We hope to see you again at the next Chase in the Impossible. Take care, guys. Have a great one. We'd love to see you soon. Take care.